everyone. Thank you for joining us for diabetes course week number two. Today, we're going to talk about hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, and nutrition. Hello, I'm Jennifer Kalis, nurse navigator at Connect Care 3. We met last week. And today, you can look forward to gaining the knowledge needed to make clear and confident decisions about your health, and you can feel your best, energetic, clear-minded, and content. Hi there, this is Lindsay Moran, and I'm the registered dietitian here at Connect Care 3. I will be presenting our nutrition portion today, and you'll hear from me again in weeks three, five, and six. We thank you again for joining us today. So let's recap from last week. Type two diabetes is a result of your pancreas not producing enough insulin, insulin resistance within your cells, or a combination of the two. As you recall, insulin is the key that unlocks the cell to let glucose enter. Treating your diabetes can, increase, can decrease your risk of blindness, kidney disease, and neuropathy. It can also decrease your risk of heart problems and a stroke. An A1C of less than 7% minimizes this risk. There are some risk factors that can be kept in check. These include activity level, the more active the better for the body and blood sugar levels, weight management so the glucose can more easily enter the cells so you feel energetic, clear-minded, and content, and food choices that stabilize those blood sugar levels. Today we will be discussing hypoglycemia or low blood sugar and hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. There will also be an introduction into healthy eating choices. And just to review our objectives this week, our clinical objectives are that you will learn more about managing diabetes in your daily life at home, work, and play. This includes checking your blood sugar level at home, how to care for yourself when the blood sugar levels are too high or too low, as well as what to do when you are sick. For nutrition objectives, you will also learn about the relationship between food and your blood sugar. This includes identifying the three macronutrients, understanding how carbohydrates affect your blood sugar, and learning the basics of how to build a well-balanced meal. With that, let's get started. Blood glucose or blood sugar monitoring is the primary tool that you have to determine if your blood glucose levels are within your target range. It's a snapshot view, different from the A1C test, which tells an average blood sugar over two to three months. You are probably familiar with how your blood glucose levels naturally increase after eating, as well as vary in response to the different types of food you eat. You have also most likely noticed that it increases in response to stress and infections. Your doctor may have instructed you to check your blood sugar at several different times throughout the day. And as you know, it is important to check these levels as directed by your doctor, as well as to log the results. When you log your results and take them to your appointments, you and your provider will have a clear picture of your body's response to your diabetes care plan. It's important for blood glucose levels to stay in a healthy range. If you're not aware of what this range is for you, please contact your doctor if glucose levels get too low, you can lose the ability to think clearly and function normally. If levels get too high and stay high, you won't feel your best and damage can occur to your body over the course of years. So what's important to remember from this slide? That monitoring your blood sugar levels at home is a critical tool for you to feel your best. These levels tell you when you're doing something right. They tell you when it might be time to make some changes in your day-to-day -day management. They also tell you when it's time to talk with your doctor about changes in your treatment plan so you can feel your best. The hemoglobin A1C test. This measures the amount of glucose attached to hemoglobin, the oxygen carrying protein in your red blood cells that gives blood its color. As blood glucose levels rise, so does the amount of glucose attached to the hemoglobin. Since each hemoglobin molecule is present until the red blood cells die, this test measures average blood glucose levels over two to three months. Thankfully, this is a convenient test for you. It doesn't require fasting. As you have experienced, A1C tests are usually performed every three months or less frequently if your blood glucose levels are stable and you are meeting your treatment goals. 
As you can see from the slide, an A1C level of 6.5% or higher meets the criteria for diabetes. An A1C level of 5.7% to 6.4% increases the risk of diabetes occurring, and this is called pre-diabetes. You can also see on the slide the correlating blood sugar levels with A1C levels. For example, an A1C level of 6% is a blood sugar level of 126 milligrams per deciliter. Next, we're going to talk about hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. This is easy to remember. We're all familiar with a child who is hyper. They have too much energy. And so it is with high blood sugar. It is known as hyperglycemia or too much sugar in the blood. This has a number of causes. It could be that you ate more than you planned or had more carbohydrates like bread or rice than usual. Maybe you've exercised less than planned. Maybe you are stressed or you're ill with a cold, the flu or an infection. When you are sick, your body releases hormones to fight the illness and hormones raise your blood sugar levels. Hyperglycemia could also be called by short-term or long-term pain as well as dehydration and the side effect of a medication such as a steroid. This typically occurs gradually. The signs and symptoms are increased thirst, frequent urination, blurred vision, fatigue, and headaches. If these symptoms occur, check your blood sugar level and follow your doctor's orders. You can also often lower your blood sugar level by exercising. However, if your blood sugar level is more than 240 milligrams per deciliter, please check your urine for ketones. If you have ketones, do not exercise because when you exercise with ketones, you may make your blood sugar go even higher. You can also lower your blood sugar levels by cutting down on the amount of food you eat. It is important to work with your dietitian, your doctor, to make the necessary changes to stabilize and lower your blood sugar level. If hyperglycemia is not treated, it can become a serious problem called ketoacidosis or diabetic coma. This develops when your body doesn't have enough insulin and it uses fat for energy. When your body breaks down fat, it produces a waste product called ketones. When your body cannot rid itself of all the ketones, they build up in your blood and lead to ketoacidosis. This is potentially life-threatening and requires immediate treatment in an emergency room. Symptoms could be shortness of breath, a fruity breath odor, nausea and vomiting, as well as a very dry mouth. I remember working in an emergency room when a patient walked in, they were staggering, their speech was slurred, they had a really fruity odor all around their body, even just when you walked by quickly. They were also very confused. We might have thought they were intoxicated, but in reality, they were experiencing hyperglycemia. Their blood sugar levels were above 600. So the key point, if you have high blood sugar levels, talk to your doctor so you can feel your best, avoid unwanted complications, and enjoy life. This next slide reviews the signs and symptoms just in a different format for you. The key point, if you experience a high blood sugar level, please check it. If it is over 240 milligrams per deciliter for several tests, contact your doctor. Don't wait for your next appointment to talk with him or her. Next, let's look at the opposite, hypo or low blood sugar. This is easy to remember because hypo rhymes with low. Throughout the day, depending upon multiple factors, your blood sugars will go up or down. This is normal. And if it's within a healthy range, you probably won't even know it. But if your blood sugar level goes below this range and is not treated, it can get dangerous. If it has fallen below the target range, you need to take action to bring the level back up. This is usually when the blood sugar level is less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. However, some of you may start to have symptoms of hypoglycemia when your blood sugar level is even higher than 70 milligrams per deciliter. So how does hypoglycemia happen? It could be because there's too much insulin. It could be that when you eat, your blood sugar levels go down because you haven't had enough carbohydrates or you've missed a meal or a snack. In eating foods with less carb carbohydrates than usual without reducing the amount of insulin could also cause low blood sugar. It's also important to think about the composition of the meal, how much fat, protein, and fiber are present. This can affect the absorption of the carbohydrates. 
And our dietitian, Lindsay, who you met earlier, will discuss this in more detail. Exercise also has many benefits, but can lower your blood sugar if you exercise too hard. So the signs and symptoms typically occur very quickly, and each person's reaction to low blood sugar will be individualized. So you want to become familiar with your own signs of hypoglycemia. If you're unfamiliar with what it looks like for you, the list that's provided may help you to, to identify when it is occurring to you. Did you know that if blood sugar levels continue to drop, the brain does not get enough glucose and stops functioning as it should? And you experience symptoms like dizziness, irritability, color draining from your face, nausea, sweating, blurred vision, and shakiness. And there might be some more se severe symptoms like confusion, sleepiness, coordination problems, and even seizures. You may even experience a thumping heart, sweating, tingling, numbness of the lips and tongues or cheeks, and anxiety. This is because the low blood sugar triggers the release of adrenaline or epinephrine, the fight or flight hormone. So how do we treat this? If you are experiencing episodes of hypoglycemia, it is helpful to discuss treatment with your doctor. He or she knows what blood sugar level is too low for you. Showing your doctor a record of your blood sugar levels, medications, maybe insulin doses, exercise, and food choices helps your physician to know what is best for your body. Needless to say, the more information you can give your healthcare provider, the better they can work with you to understand what is causing the lows. So how do we treat it? The only sure way to know whether you are experiencing low blood sugar is to check it, if possible. However, if you are experiencing symptoms and you're unable to check it for any reason, treat the hypoglycemia. I imagine many of you are familiar with the 15-15 rule. The 15-15 rule is consume 15 grams of carbohydrate to raise your blood sugar level and check it after 15 minutes. If it's still below 70 milligrams per deciliter or what your doctor has recommended, have another serving of 15 grams of carbohydrates. Repeat these steps until your blood sugar is at least 70 milligrams per deciliter. And once your blood sugar is back to normal, eat a meal or a snack to make sure it doesn't lower again. I'm wondering if you have experienced, like many, wanting to eat as much as you can until you feel better when your blood sugar is low. Have you noticed that this can cause a spike in your blood sugar level? Therefore, you are aware that using the stepwise approach of the 15-15 rule can help you avoid that. So let's review those foods that contain 15 grams of carbohydrate. They are three glucose tablets, four ounces or one half cup of juice or regular soda, not diet soda, one tablespoon of sugar or honey, or six to seven hard candies. Please remember, if things are serious or someone is unconscious, always call 911. And this is a slide, again, that reviews the signs and symptoms in a different format for you. The key, follow the 15-15 rule and test your blood sugar level when it is low. Next, let's look at how to avoid hyper and hypoglycemia when you are sick. Like everyone, people with diabetes can get sick even when trying their best to prevent it. So being prepared and talking with your doctor about the best way to handle being sick if it happens is very important. The good news, you can stay safe while you're ill. As you are aware, an illness can make it harder to manage your diabetes. However, you and your diabetes care team can work together to develop a sick day plan before you become ill and make it easier to manage it. Your team can also let you know when to contact them. Again, please talk with your doctor to know how the following principles apply to your particular situation. So when you are sick, you'll want to check your blood sugar often, at least every three to four hours, and track the results. This is because when your body releases hormones to fight the illness, these hormones can raise your blood sugar level. And if you happen to be taking insulin regularly, it can increase how much insulin you need. This is especially important for people with type 1 diabetes. You'll want to continue to take your diabetes medicines as prescribed unless your doctor tells you not to do so. You also want to check with your pharmacist or doctor before taking any over-the-counter medicines, any cough syrup or decongestants, to see if they might raise or lower your blood sugar. Just a reminder to choose sugar-free medicine when they are available. Eating well is also important when you are sick. 
So try to follow your usual meal plan. The CDC recommends 50 grams of carbohydrates every four hours from food choices. Examples of the 50 gram of grams of carbohydrates are one half cup of regular gelatin dessert, six soda crackers, one slice of toast, or a half cup of orange or apple juice. And yes, always remember to drink up. If you feel too sick to eat solid foods, be sure to drink six to eight ounces of liquid every hour. Switch back and forth between drinks, drinks that contain sugar and drinks that do not. For example, one hour drink regular fruit, fruit juice and or a soft drink. The next hour drink a sugar-free soft drink, tea or water. And if allowed by your doctor, you could try bouillon or clear soup. So the bottom line is never hesitate to call your provider. You may call because you don't know what to do. You may call because your blood sugar is less than 70 milligrams per deciliter or higher than 240 milligrams per deciliter for more than two checks. If you're experiencing vomiting or diarrhea, please call your provider. Or you're not eating, you're ill for more than 24 hours, and if your temperature is greater than 101 degrees. It's just a reminder then to check your temperature every morning and every evening when you are ill. The key takeaway, what do I want you to remember? It is best to be prepared for a sick day. Talk with your doctor to develop your customized sick day plan. This will ease your mind and your families. So now you have learned about hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, as well as how to care for yourself when you are ill. Lindsay is going to speak with you about nutrition. Please feel free to stand up and stretch as we begin this segment of today's presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. When looking to manage your diabetes, an important place to start is with nutrition. A healthy, well-balanced diet is key to keeping your blood sugars in an optimal range. Following a healthy diet may also decrease your risk of complications and additional chronic conditions, as well as help you to achieve or maintain a healthy weight. Oftentimes, many think that this type of diet is full of restriction and difficult to achieve. However, the truth is that you can still include a lot of your favorite foods into a diabetic diet. It all just comes down to balance, variety, and moderation. A recipe for a delicious diabetic diet includes balanced meals and snacks with the five food groups. It also includes variety in your routine by choosing different foods in order to meet all of your nutritional needs. The different colors of fruits and vegetables indicate a wide variety of vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients. So be sure to eat all different kinds. Lastly, enjoy your treats in moderation and be mindful of portion sizes. It's not realistic to think that you'll never have a piece of birthday cake or a slice of pizza again. Instead, focus on moderation. Can you choose to have one slice of pizza with a side salad? or to choose a smaller piece of birthday cake at your next special occasion? If you are consistently making healthful nutrition choices, a moderate amount of these treats are okay. To help keep portion sizes in check, try using measuring cups and spoons, portioning out snack foods into smaller containers, and paying attention to your body's hunger and fullness cues. Next, we'll talk about the three macronutrients. There are three macronutrients that each and every one of us needs in order to properly fuel our bodies. These are carbohydrates, protein, and fats. When planning a balanced diet, it's important to understand the difference between these three nutrients. We'll start off with everyone's favorite, carbohydrates, or carbs for short. Carbohydra carbohydrates often get a bad reputation, especially with all of the current low carb diet trends such as keto. However, it's important to note that carbs are actually our body's preferred source of energy and are a very important component to our diet. Sources of carbohydrates include bread, pasta, rice, fruits, vegetables, sweet treats, and many more. All carbohydrates are broken down into glucose or sugar in our bodies. This means that consuming carbohydrates will cause your blood sugar to rise. It's a common misconception that people with diabetes must avoid most carbohydrates. However, the truth is that they can and should be fit into a healthy diabetic diet, 
with some planning and balance, of course. Next up, we have protein. Protein has several functions, including helping our bodies to grow by building and repairing muscle tissues. Everything from your hair to your muscles, your heart cells and skin contain protein. This macronutrient also helps you to stay fuller for longer and helps provide nourishment for optimal recovery after exercise. Protein rich foods include meat, poultry, fish, eggs, milk, cheese, and other types of animal products, as well as a variety of plant protein sources, such as beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, and soy products. Finally, we'll discuss fat. Fat allows you to store energy, cushions your organs, allows you to make certain hormones, and also helps to absorb those fat-soluble vitamins. There are three types of fat, trans fat, saturated fat, and unsaturated fat. Trans fat should be avoided as much as possible. It may be found in foods like margarine, shortening, baked goods, doughs, and fried foods. If you see trans fat on the label, it is likely not the healthiest choice. Next up is saturated fat. In large amounts, saturated fat is known to increase cholesterol levels and may increase your risk for heart disease. Decreasing the amount of saturated fat in your diet may be beneficial. This type of fat is found mostly in animal sources that have high fat contents, such as fatty beef, fattier cuts of lamb or pork, poultry with the skin on it, lard, cream, butter, or full fat cheese and dairy products. It is recommended that you decrease saturated fat intake and lean towards more healthy fat sources, known as unsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats are known as the healthy fats, and they may decrease your risk for heart disease. These healthy fats originate from plant sources, such as avocados, nuts and nut butters, seeds, olives, and oil oils such as olive, canola, safflower, and several others. They can also be found in some animal sources such as fatty fish, including salmon, mackerel, sardines, tuna, and herring. Fat often gets a bad reputation, however. However, when a diet focuses on unsaturated fats consumed in moderation, a healthy cuisine is enjoyed. Now that we've talked a bit about the three macronutrients, we're going to take a bit of a closer look at carbohydrates and learn how to make sure that you're incorporating an appropriate amount of carbs throughout your day. As we discussed earlier, carbohydrates are foods that give your body energy, but that also cause your blood sugar to rise. Now this doesn't mean that you can't consume carbs when you have diabetes, but it does mean that a balance is needed. When managing your intake of carbohydrates, the first thing to think about is the amount that you are eating. Too many carbs at one serving may cause your blood sugar to spike, while too little may leave you a bit low. One way to keep track of your intake is to count what, we are, what are called carbohydrate choices. One carbohydrate choice is the equivalent to 15 grams of carbohydrates. By using the nutrition facts label on your food items, you can identify how many grams of carbohydrates are located in each serving. Picture this, you're eating some crackers and on the food label, one serving size is listed to contain 15 grams of carbohydrates. This would mean that one serving of crackers equates to one carbohydrate soy choice. Furthermore, if instead the label had stated that your one serving contained 30 grams of carbohydrates, it would mean that your crackers count as two carbohydrate choices. A general recommendation is for women to include about three carb choices per meal and one to two per snack, and for men to include about four carb choices per meal and one to two per snack. Of course, like many things with nutrition, this may vary person to person, but it may be a good place to start if you are unsure. The next step in managing your carbohydrate intake is practicing balance. Now that you understand how to count carbohydrates, it's important to take a look at what other foods we should pair them with. 
It's important to try to balance our meals and snacks with at least two of the three macronutrients. So instead of just having those crackers that we talked about earlier, it might be best to add another component, such as reduced fat cheese, to incorporate a bit of fat and protein. Another example might, to, might be to add a tablespoon of peanut butter to your crackers. Or if you're having your favorite fruit, such as a banana or apple, that tablespoon of peanut butter can be added to that as well. Keeping your meals and snacks balanced not only helps to keep you feeling satisfied and fuller for longer, it also helps to keep your blood sugar stable and prevents it from spiking as it might if you were to just eat carbohydrates alone. Building a balanced plate may seem like a challenge, but using what we call the plate method helps to make it much more manageable. As you can see in the image on the slide, the plate method is a visual used to help you both balance your meal and keep portion sizes in check. The plate method is based on a plate that is nine inches in diameter, and this helps to keep that portion size optimal. Be mindful of how much food you're adding to each of these sections, and if your plate is overflowing, you may have too much. The diabetic plate method encourages the following. Fill half of your plate with non-starchy vegetables such as broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, green beans, carrots, or zucchini, to name a few. Next, fill one quarter of your plate with whole grains or starchy foods, which would be those carbohydrate-rich components we talked about. These foods include brown rice, boulder wheat, green peas, sweet potatoes, corn, or whole wheat bread. Beans, which are both starchy and a good source of protein and fiber, may fit in this section as well. Finally, fill the remaining one quarter of your plate with lean protein foods, such as fish, chicken, eggs, lean beef, pork, or soy products such as tofu. On the side, you may choose to add a serving of fruit, such as a small apple, or a serving of low-fat dairy, such as non-fat yogurt, as your meal plan allows. Finally, choose healthy fats in small amounts. For cooking, use healthy oils, such as olive oil. Other fats that may be used in your meals include nuts and nut butters, seeds, and avocados. So we've learned a bit about um, the three macronutrients, counting carbohydrates, and building a balanced plate today in our introduction to nutrition. Let's put that all together now by building a meal. Let's plan dinner together. I'm going to put some ideas on the plate that might build a well-balanced meal. To start, we can, we'll can choose our protein. Salmon's looking good tonight. And that goes in the lean protein section. Next, I might pair that with some rice, which would have, head over to our carbohydrate or starchy section. Finally, to complete the half of our plate with non-starchy vegetables, we want to add something like broccoli um, or maybe even some spinach. And remember to fill half of that plate with those non-starchy vegetables. Now again, every meal plan may vary. You might have some room to add some fruit on the side of this meal or maybe a low-fat dairy option such as yogurt. Um, keep in mind, again, that everyone's needs are different, and these are just the basics. Thank you, Lindsay. That looked like a delicious meal. As we begin to conclude today, we invite you to think about what are your most important steps to feel your best? It might be monitor and log your blood sugar levels at home as prescribed by your provider. Maybe you want to Strive to maintain your blood sugar level within your target range. Or purchase supplies and be prepared to manage a hypoglycemic episode if it occurs. Maybe you're interested in teaching a family member what to do when your blood sugar is low. And for next week's class, we invite you to keep a log of your food for one to two days. And that will help you be ready to learn more about nutrition and see what you are doing and maybe what you want to change. And lastly, you have the option to enroll in the Chronic Disease Management Program here at Connect Care 3. Enrolling in the Chronic Disease Management Program is just a phone call or email away. 
The process involves speaking with a patient advocate to enroll. A consent form will be sent to you for completion. Once the patient advocate receives the completed form, a staff member will reach out to you within 24 hours. If you miss one of our webinar sessions, please email Amanda Crystal to access a recording of the webinar. We thank you very much for your time today. Please join us in the next week as we dive a bit deeper into nutrition. Thanks and have a wonderful day.